And we're live. Hello, everybody. It's Skip Clark from Skip Happens, along with Deb Lamphere, the president and founder of the official Country Music Fan Club. And uh, hey everyone, welcome, welcome. Yep, we hope you, you're going to stick with us tonight because I think our guest is going to be very, very, very cool. Total <laughs> most respect for this gentleman. His name is David Starr. And uh, if when we get off here, Google, Google him. Google David Starr Musician, because if you don't, you'll get a wrestler, I believe. So, I or, or, or a race car driver. There you go. Yeah. Oh, that's right. That's, mm -hmm. There you go. Yes, exactly. But David Starr, musician, and uh, David is a singer-songwriter. He's got nine albums to his name. He, um, he uh, is, leans a little bit more on the Americana side of things. And uh, David, welcome. How are you, my friend? I'm great. Thank you for having me. It's, it's a pleasure. Now, whereabouts are you? And describe your surroundings a little bit. <clears throat> well, um, for those of you familiar with Colorado, uh, I'm on the Western Slope. Uh, for those of you who may not be as familiar, we're we're probably the nearest town of any size <clears throat> or substantial size is Grand Junction, which is on the far west border of the state with with Utah. Uh, the The cool thing about our surroundings, Cedar Edge, Colorado, where I am, is on the south base of Grand Mesa, which is wow. the largest flat top mountain in the world. Yeah. So that's Grand Mesa National Forest, and it it literally looks like somebody just cut the top off the mountain, but it was made that way from volcanic activity a zillion years ago. So 300 lakes up there, 800 square miles of hiking and fishing and camping and snowmobiling and you name it. So it's a beautiful place to be, and frankly, with what's going on on the planet, it's a really great place to be because we're kind of we're kind of out here on our own, and it's nice. I was going to ask if you're like out in the middle of nowhere. Well, I wouldn't say that because I'm I'm in a guitar store, and you don't want a guitar <laughs> store completely in the middle of nowhere. No, well, that's true. But you do, you know, it's it's a destination, you know. So, uh, but it's a, it's a good place to be. Less density. Have you gone up to the top of the mountain and kind of explored a little bit? I know you said it's 800 square miles, so and it's got yeah. a bunch of lakes, but that's got to be pretty cool. It's it's beautiful, uh, you know, with. There, there are some lodges up there in a, an area where there are cabins on with lakes and so forth. And I, my house is sort of on the side of that mountain. So uh, on a on a good day, I can see 75 miles in three directions out the front door. And then my back door is the mountain rising up like that. So I, it, it puts things in perspective sometimes. Mm -hmm. Wow, that must be amazing. It's nice. Yeah. What about your surroundings where you are? I see a bunch of wires and uh, maybe a guitar in the background. <laughs> well, uh, in, a, in, a, in addition to being a singer, songwriter and, writer and touring musician, uh -huh. I've had a guitar store here in town for almost 20 years and three years before that down in Little Rock, Arkansas. So where I am right now is the place where no one gets to go, really. It's kind of in the back of the store and there's some, it's kind of the land of forgotten toys back here. The store actually looks pretty cool, but I've got a young man doing some work out front tonight uh helping me with some maintenance stuff so i'm kind of sequestered back here so um normally i'd be in a better surrounding i say so we can't have a tour tonight huh well i can't lift this mac up and drag it around <laughs> and another time i would love to though we could we could have a whole nother discussion about the guitars uh -huh. tell us about your songwriting and being uh you know where you are in colorado and being in that type of environment uh how does that enhance your songwriting well, you know, when people think of songwriting in Colorado, they often think of John Denver, and that's just, he did so much back in the 70s to draw attention to the Rockies, and and uh, so I get I get that whole thing, and I look out and I see this beautiful valley below me and the stars at night and all that stuff. It More than anything, um, it gives me perspective and clears my head and lets me think about what I need to think about to write a song. Um, oftentimes... As a writer, I'm I'm way too much in my own head, um, and so sometimes it's like good to go outside, side, take a deep breath, and go, okay, let's get some perspective on this issue, whatever it is we're talking about in our head, and mm -hmm. and it, it does it helps clear the, you know, clear the cobwebs out a little bit. Do you uh, write by yourself a lot, or do you co-write more often? Well, um, I, I write a lot by myself, but the most recent project was. Um, was completely collaborative um and if it 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 revolved around um it revolved around a book mm -hmm. that my grandfather wrote back in the wow. 70s mm -hmm. this is a reprint of it we've reprinted it and 
I read the book years after his death and said, you know, there, there's, sounds like there's some, the way he wrote it, just very descriptive and very uh, sort of cinematic. And I thought there are songs in there. So I took that book to my friend, John Oates of Hall and Oates. And he, he and I'd worked together on another one of my projects and played together quite a bit and stuff. And I said, would you read this book and tell me if you think there are songs in there? And I already knew the answer. Right. So, mm -hmm. so, uh, so he calls me in a couple of days and he said, Oh yeah. What do you want to do? I said, I want to give this book to about five of our songwriting friends. And then we all collaborate and write songs inspired by the book. And that's, that's what the new album is all about. So wow. and the name of that album, that's beauty that, and ruin. Is that correct? Beauty and ruin. I don't know if yeah. that's, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it's hard to see with the player. Hey, oh, no. I love the CDs. We were talking about that one other time. So many, I, I mean, if there's a CD with the packaging and the artwork and all the, all the writing on the inside, I think uh, that's one of my favorite things about new music. Yeah. Well, and, and that's, that seems to be a, a disappearing thing, you know, mm -hmm. unfortunately, I, I think it's important to give everybody that wrote on it credit and I think the people that play the play the instruments really ought to get credit too. So I try to make sure I include everybody. Tell us about. Oh, go ahead, Deb. Oh no, I I was just curious. Uh, did you read that book way back? You were younger, and then just decide to pick it up again. No, I knew he was a writer. I we were great friends, and he was a mentor of mine as a kid, and taught me to ride horses and work outside and go for long walks. I mean, he he taught me a lot, but. I was busy being a kid and it just never occurred to me to read these books. And he, he'd written several all the way back into the late thirties. He wrote these little books about the wit and wisdom of the Ozarks and stuff, mm -hmm. kind of Mark Twain sort of uh, homespun humor and whatnot. But I just never read them because I was busy, you know, I had other stuff. I was playing, playing in bands and all that, you know, and going to school. So I didn't really read this book until about eight years ago and he died in 73. So, Oh, wow. My biggest regret is that I can't go back and say how much of this dramatic, devastatingly tragic stuff in this book, how much of that actually happened? Because mm -hmm. I don't know. You know, right. we'll never will. So. Right. But still, there's a lot of a lot comes out of that book uh, when it comes to songwriting. There's a lot of songs in there. Sure. It's gotta be. It's gotta be. Sure. How, so tell us about your beginnings, uh, how you started to play music. You said you played in bands and then you've been writing. And then now with John Hall, um, oh, John, Oates. Hall, John Oates. And yeah, that's right. We, as a matter of fact, I, I, I met John, John Oates. I think matter of fact, I know it was a, um, Oh, St. Jude event. And yes. I do a lot of St. Jude and yes. John Oates was there and, um, really just a great guy to, to talk to, but mm -hmm. uh, t tell us about your past and how you got to where you are today. Well, <clears throat> when I grew up in Fayetteville, Arkansas, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a guitar store there. And when I was about 10, I noticed my little, my older brother, I guess I was nine. My older brother was taking guitar lessons and I thought, well, I want to do something like that. You know, I want to be cool. And, uh, <laughs> We'd all, we'd all seen the Beatles on TV right. and the Stones were out in the kinks and the, the who and uh, oh my gosh, the Rascals and Dave Clark Five and Paul Revere and the Raiders. And all that stuff was in my head because I heard it on the radio. Even as a little kid, I thought I want to do something like that. I felt that creative instinct. So I started taking drum lessons at the same store where he took guitar lessons. And I only took for six or eight months, but I got to the point where I felt like I could um, felt like I could play a little bit. And of course, at that age, I thought I knew everything. So I just went, that's enough with the lessons. I don't need any more of that. Okay. But of I course. began, I began by the time I was 12 or so to play with friends. And, um, the, one of the funny stories is the only reason I became the singer is because I owned the microphone. Really? <laughs> so somebody said, well, it's your mic you sing. And I played drums and sang. Wow. So I was a singing drummer most of my life and I still love doing that. I don't get to do it much. Um, but, but, you know, I just grew up playing in bands and, and mm -hmm. playing bars and homecoming parties and frat parties. And, and then over time just developed, a uh, an interest in going off on my own and doing, uh, doing singer songwriter stuff and met people like John along the way. And yeah, that's pretty cool. So, yeah. That's pretty cool. And, uh, the whole John Oates thing and talk, talk to us about that. 
Well, John owns a house about two hours from here over in the Roaring Fork Valley in Asp- uh, just outside of Aspen. Aspen yes. I lived there in the early 80s, so mm-hmm. he wasn't there then, but we all know a lot of the same people. And some of the guys that he used uh, as part of his solo band in the early part of the 20th, 21st century are friends of mine. And one day they suggested, well, we should get John to come over and play a gig in this little town because I, I would promote gigs here in town and have John McEwen from the Dirt Band and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, Michael Johnson used to come and play and Carla Bonoff's been here and numerous other other artists. And I just always, people would say to me, how do you get these artists to come play here? And I said, well, you pay them because that's what they do. They go around yes. and they play. And <laughs> and if people buy tickets, they, they'll play. So um they asked John about it and he said, well, yeah, if the guy can play, let's do it. So John emailed me four songs from the album that was current at that time. And he said, learn the slide parts on these. Cause I play some slide. Mm-hmm. I said, all right. He said, you'll play on these four songs. So he shows up for sound check and, and we did the first song on sound check and he looked, turned to me and he looked, and he said, well, you can play. And I went, well, <laughs> that was the idea. He said, he said, you'll just play all night then. So, I, I kind of faked it through the night and we had a wonderful time. And then we did another gig down in Northwest Arkansas and we've done a number of things, just the two of us, which is a blast where I come out and open the show um, with about four of my songs. Then he joins me for some stuff that we do together. Mm-hmm. Then I leave and then I come back and end with the Hall and Oates stuff with him just on guitar. And it's, he's so gracious. He's been great with his time. And, uh, you know, the guy's produced two of my records now, and he's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So. Yeah, you got to love that. It's pretty It's pretty yeah, cool. It's pretty darn cool. You're right. Yeah. You're right. Wow, that's it's just amazing that you've done that, and it, you've put out nine albums. You're touring still. You're, well, I, I was well, until recently. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, you know what I mean. I yeah, mean, yeah. we're all in this situation where we're pretty much not doing everything that we used to do, so we right. found new and creative ways to do these things, and right. that's why we're doing this here tonight pretty cool that we can keep in touch with the singers and the songwriters and yep. and find out what's going on and uh, talking about that how have you been handling all this uh, quarantine stuff i mean how's that working for you well um <laughs> the the last real show i played was at the station inn in in nashville had my big cd release in nashville which was the night after the big tornado in nashville oh my goodness oh wow so the tornado happened I got up that morning and said, let's turn this show into a tornado relief thing. Mm-hmm. Got it out on the news, got it out on all the, all the, the sites that we could. So we raised a couple of thousand bucks for tornado victims, which in the scheme of things ain't much, but it was something, you know? It was something. Something. Yeah. And, and so I played that. And then my wife and I both flew to Denver knowing that this coronavirus thing was out there a little bit, but we didn't know it still wasn't a thing like it is now. Sure. We both flew to Denver and then we split up because she was going out to Kauai where her son and grandkids live. She was going to visit for about 13 days, I think. And I came on back here. Well, she got, she got more or less stuck on Kauai for two months. Oh, wow. Um, now when you say stuck on Kauai, people go, well, that's just terrible. You know, that's, no, no, that's more to it. Than- <laughs> but, but when you're anywhere, you, you don't plan on being for two months, then it's stuck, mm-hmm. but they right. would, United would say, well, we've got your flight rescheduled, but it goes from Lahui to Honolulu to Toronto to Houston to Denver to Montrose, Colorado, which was just nuts, you know. So, oh my so she stayed She yeah. stayed long enough, uh, and, and I said one day, get a flight to San Francisco, and I'll drive out and pick you up in the motorhome, which is two days from here. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I just did that, which got me out of here and got her out of there. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. But, well, um, you know, the governor, the governor in Colorado closed down – did kind of a shutdown order, a stay at home order pretty early on. Mm-hmm. And so I closed my guitar store and we were closed for five, six weeks, maybe. And mm-hmm. I would come down and just sit here and go, well, what's, what's going to happen? And the phone would ring and somebody would say, oh man, you're there. Can I come down and buy an amp real quick? And I go, yeah, come down and buy an amp real quick. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, and, and oddly so- enough, oddly enough, it's worked out better than I would have thought given mm-hmm. the, the craziness in the world. So, it's, you know, yeah. So you were by yourself the whole two months while she was gone. Just, and your me, store and was closed? just me and the dogs. Yeah. The dogs. Oh my 
gosh. Well, so, it's good that you had some company there. Yeah, you know, and <laughs> and I and I started doing some live streaming and that sort of thing, which mm -hmm. oddly enough, you know, I, I've got a camera that's made for that. And so I was sort of prepared maybe better than some. Um so one night I just I set it up as an event on Facebook to make sure I'd committed myself and I had to follow through. <laughs> and I set up a, a thing and got the lighting pretty good. And I went out one night in my studio and just like you guys do, you hit, okay, we're going live. Mm -hmm. And I started talking and singing into this little red light, you know, on the camera. Mm -hmm. And I looked down a little bit and it had been an hour and 38 minutes. <laughs> See, you get going thought, on something, you're having some fun. I thought, man, it felt good just to yep. do something, you know? Yeah. And so, so I've done a fair bit of that. Uh, one of the things I've worked on uh, recently, it's on my YouTube channel, and we're going to keep adding to that, but is one day I was talking to my friends in Nashville, Olivia and Kate, that work with me and on my team down there, and I said, what if I did a thing where I just took, like I've got a fair, fairly decent little collection of vintage guitars of my own, in addition to the store guitars. What if I just grabbed a guitar and said, I'm going to talk about this one today for 10 minutes why I like it, what the story about how I got it, maybe how it fell off a truck and I fixed it, whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I've been doing these little episodes and they're up on my YouTube channel. And that's a great, I think you just, we all have been trying to find ways to stay relevant and busy, you know? And I've said this right along that, uh, you know, there's, of course, there's the bad side to this pandemic. I get that. But in a sense, there is a good side. And the good mm -hmm. side, side is it's forced you to do these things that, you probably would not have done otherwise. Right. You know, I mean, you went online, you did the Facebook live, and now you've thought of different things like spotlighting a guitar, talk, you know, talking about that guitar. Deb and I are, you know, we've taken our podcast yep. to the web like this and doing them live and right. face with people like yourself who are stars and people that have put out the albums and the people that are behind, behind the scenes as a songwriter, which you are, which is pretty cool. So it's forced us to do a lot of this really cool stuff. Well, and I think, I think when all is said and done, if things somehow could be better tomorrow, I think a lot of us would keep doing this mm -hmm. because it's engagement above and beyond the gigs and the travel and all that. And, you know, it's interesting when you look at a, a band that that's their entire year has been canceled. Somebody like a, well, like Hall and Oates, you know, those guys, mm -hmm. yep. they had a huge tour with squeeze and, and uh, KT Tunstall opening. And, yep. you know, a, a year out that puts those guys another year older. And, and yeah. I mean, it's the whole thing. It's just a big shift in your, your thinking. So um, I've, I've been thinking about the future a lot and what, what that's going to look like. And I still don't have that figured out. No, I don't think anybody has it figured out. No, um, I think about that almost every day when I, I have my cup of coffee and I sit down and I just kind of chill for a couple of minutes and go, "Where are we going? What are we going to yeah. be doing? What what you know? I what's going to be next?" Yep. Well, it does force us to branch out a little bit and step out of our comfort zone. Sure. You know, when we first started doing this, we really weren't sure what direction we were going to go in and who we wanted to talk to and bring to the table it just and it just sort of falls into place and you thought wow you know just stretching a little bit really helps you grow in one manner or another you know so yeah it's, it's, mm -hmm. it does have little mini blessings in there i certainly feel bad for the people that you know have gotten sick or or have uh, you know passed away on this but there's so many different positivenesses that has gone on that we yeah. just have to sit back and think of those things so. I try to, I try to every day think, okay, what, what can I take advantage of in a positive mm -hmm. way that's going to make this better for me and maybe better for the people around me? And, you know, I'm pretty active in this community. Um, my wife and I were active in helping to get started a, a place called the Grand Mesa Arts and Events Center, uh -huh. which has been open about two years and cool. two years and one month or something. Well, you know, we've had oats there a couple of times. We've, I've played there a few times. Carla Bonoff, we've done, there's a ga an art gallery with local painters that come in and every six or eight weeks we rotate out. Mm -hmm. So it was really going great guns. Um, and then it just had to stop. So we've been trying to think of ways to do virtual art shows and virtual painting classes for kids. And, you know, we're doing a happy hour outside where everybody sits 10 feet apart and somebody plays mm -hmm. across the parking lot just anything for us to, to keep, 
to keep people engaged over there and try to give back since they were helping us. They helped us get going, you know? Yeah. I mean, some great ideas and you could do it virtual, which is pretty cool. And so many people are just take a look around you. I mean, everybody's coming up with different ideas. So yep, it's kind of cool. Um, your writing, your songwriting, uh, what other artists have uh, actually performed your songs? Who have you written for? Well, not not really anybody. I mean, I, I, I kind of made a decision not to chase that too much. I mean, early on, the, the first three albums I did were more, I, I look back at them as uh, probably more therapy than anything because I played all the instruments, mm -hmm. did all the vocals. I would work on them in my off hours and they were done on all, you all been at this long enough to know. First we had, we had ADAT machines, then we had, or we reel to reel and then ADAT and then, yep, yep. you know, task camps, you know, so you sure. wind up with all these songs that are partially done in all these different formats. Well, I, I tried to finish enough of them to make a record three different times. And so, um, but then maybe, maybe four of those, I guess, but then I went down to Nashville in 2013 <clears throat> and I did, I did six songs that were going to be um, demos. And I had a publisher friend who was going to shop them around. And we just didn't, nobody was interested because it was right at the the front end of the whole bro country thing. And my my influences are more country rock. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm an Eagles fan, a Jackson Brown mm -hmm. fan, a Birds, J.D. Souther, Southern California <laughs> stuff. I love it. Yeah. And, and so I was sort of, while my stuff fell into that country rock uh, sort of category, that wasn't where Nashville was at the moment. And I really, nobody was interested. So I went back and recorded six more songs and said, okay, there's my album. Mm -hmm. And I kind of, I kind of just quit worrying about, you know, trying to get other people to do them. It would be beautiful and I'd love it, but mm -hmm. uh, I've kind of just decided to make records that make me feel good about what I'm leaving behind for the grandkids and so forth, you know, and, yeah. and to have early on John Oates and I talked about this and I said, I'm, you know, about four years ago, I said, I'm under no illusion about where making records goes for a 60 year old guy these days, you know, cause it's, it's a young man's game and it always has been mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Now you can start out and get old in it. If you can do that gracefully, that's fine, but it's pretty hard to come crashing in there at 60. And uh, Just, so, yeah, it, no, I but the one, one of the things he said was there's something to be said just for having the experience, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and exactly. you're doing what you love, you know. Yep. I mean, yep. And that's and, and you've got you're branched and out, branched out in so many different categories. So this is just one of your loves that you are fulfilling. Right. Right. And he's very so. successful at it, which is Absolutely. cool. And you mentioned the Eagles and and bands like that, and it kind of leans a little bit towards that Americana sound. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're talking about the Eagles and what you do. I've heard some of your music. We were playing it before we went on tonight. <laughs> just to hear more of what you're about. And uh, just, I'm falling in love with it. It's just great, well, thanks. great stuff. Um, talk to us about uh, your YouTube channel. You said if somebody wanted to subscribe to your YouTube channel, maybe somebody's into guitars or tell us a little bit about that side of you. Well, one of the things that, that this, this whole pandemic situation has sort of forced me to focus on is the social media part of the world, which I've used it for a long time, mm -hmm. but like a lot of people, I have kind of a love hate relationship with it because mm -hmm. there are days I just want to go, I'm out. I don't want any more of this, you know, <laughs> I because there's, those days. <laughs> yeah, cause there, there's just a lot of, there's just, you know, it seems like on a lot of, particularly Facebook, people can be ugly without any repercussion, you know, and I just think that's unfortunate. But one of the things we, we decided as a team was to, to really work on the YouTube channel. Cause that's where stuff lives forever, at least forever as we know it. And so I'm trying to build this catalog of um, nice music videos, mm -hmm. put all the albums up there where you can go and stream those if you want. And then this whole series called On Guitars, which are my, uh, they're not overly technical guitar things. It's more, hey, this is, this is my 1958 Stratocaster. I bought it years ago, then I sold it, then I got it back. And Dan Fogelberg played it, Jeff Hannes played it, all my old, you know, country friends have played it. So you know, just trying to make some, some cool content that people would want to see. And it's the YouTube channel is David star music. If you go to YouTube. Okay. That's good. Yeah. I wanted to, yes. Excellent. David star yeah. music, YouTube channel. How about like Jeff Hanna with the nitty gritty dirt band? Have you actually played with those guys? I know <laughs> that same guitar shop. I took drums in. 
Uh-huh. I'm, that's where I met Jeff and Jimmy uh, Ibbotson. Oh, wow. 1974. Oh. And I was in that store and I was just, I don't know, 15, 16, whatever. I could drive a car, I guess. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and those guys came in. And of course, I'd been listening to the Dirt Band and I'd worn out Uncle Charlie and his dog. You know, what a great record that was. And so I walk up to him and I say, Yeah, you guys, you guys are in that nitty gritty dirt band. I said, Yeah, yeah. And there's a band in Northwest Arkansas called the Kate Brothers. And those guys are all friends of mine. And, and Earl Kate ran that guitar store at the time. And I remember Jeff said, I hear they're playing in town tonight. Can you get us in to see them? And I went, Well, yeah. And it was this bar underneath the hotel that they didn't start till 11 o'clock at night, you know. He said, We'll get you into the dirt band show if you'll get us in to see them. And I went, Pfft. Okay. <laughs> So, okay. <laughs> so I've known, I've known those guys a long time and John, John McEwen, who's not with the band anymore, but we're, we're good friends. And he comes out here and plays a lot in our place. Um, in fact, I saw Jeff last fall at the Americana Fest. He and Sam Bush were doing a thing at the museum down there. And, um, and then I played with Ibbotson quite a bit when I lived in Aspen and the funny thing, Jeff and Jimmy and the late Vic Garrett, who was a bass player there in Aspen, we had a band on some Sunday nights at this one bar when the dirt band wasn't on the road. Mm-hmm. We didn't really have a name for it. And we would just take turns going around. Who's got a song? Who's got a song? And since they knew I knew Leave on Helm, my job was always to sing the wait, you know, <laughs> to do the singing, do the singing drummer thing. You know, I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> how many, how many instruments do you play? You have the guitar, the drums. Um, and you know, if, if I've, if I'm pushed, I can play some piano okay. um, and and I don't play any horns or any strings or anything. Okay. A little bit of mandolin, little, you know, and, and guitar. I, I think of myself as a recovering drummer, really, because, <laughs> um, pe- you know, I go into the studio with these guys who just blow your mind how good they are and how spontaneous. And I think I'll just play chords. You guys make it, mm-hmm. you know, make it happen. So I know my limitations, as Clint Eastwood says, but... Uh, um, yeah. I'm sure I sure don't know what I'd do without music, you know. No, but you're saying how good these guys are. You got to remember, you're right up there with them. You've well, I'm all the albums and everything that you've put out, all your music you've written and, and done yourself for the most part. I mean, don't don't underestimate yourself, man. Well, thank you. I, you know, even you're right. I mean, you and I both we're not we're not little kids anymore. We're not. You know, I'm I'm in my 60s, so I'm right, right. with you, my friend. And mm-hmm. uh, you know what? It just just love what you do and keep doing it and don't ever yep. self down. And uh, I'm happy. I'm happy to have yeah. made it this far. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a few years younger, but I'm not too far away. So well, pretty awesome. It pretty comes awesome. Up quick. Comes up quick. How often so, do you get to Nashville? That was my next question. You and I are well, always thinking the same way. I tell go you. Ahead, Jeff, ask it. No, no, no. Well, you're about, good. <laughs> well, about, about three years ago, I was going quite a bit, you know, every six or eight weeks. And it was getting pretty expensive because I was staying in hotels and stuff. So uh, a producer friend of mine that I've known since I was a little kid, his son-in-law had a place come up for sale in a, in a building down in the Gulch area there. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, and it's a small place. It's, you know, it it would fit in this room I'm in, you know, it's just a 600 square foot condo, but it came up for sale and he told me, I'll let you know if I want to sell it. So we bought it and there's a, we keep a car there. Um, Lately, I haven't been much. But I'm going. I'm going down in uh, in August, and I'm going to record and check on whatever's in the refrigerator. And <laughs> uh, uh, but I'm going to do some recording, and I th- I think if the plan holds up, I'm going to record a bunch of cover tunes because I've always wanted. There are songs that I've played in bands that I've played as a soloist. When I when I used to go in and play a restaurant gig for three hours, I mean you got to fill the time, right? So mm-hmm. I would do some Jackson Brown or some John Hyatt or. I was going to um, ask what you would do for a cover song. Yeah, you know, and and I, those some of the some of them are a little bit obvious, and then and then some I want to I want to pull some. There's a there's a song by the Cars called Drive. Yes, oh, no. Who's going to drive you home? Yeah. Oh my God. I've oh, always God. wanted to cover that, mm-hmm. but do it with mandolins and acoustic guitars. Just do a just think way outside the box with some of this stuff. And so we've kind of got studio time set up and I'm going to work with a buddy of mine down there and we're going to great. put together this project and I don't know what I'm going to do with it. I guess call you guys when it's ready. You yes, know, absolutely. <laughs> call us. But, I, you get it out there. But uh, what a great I idea. You do the, I'm sorry, Skip. I love when there's uh, remakes of the songs. Um, 
Well, well just, like on on my album that was out a couple of years ago called South and West, I re I redid a uh, I covered an Elton John song from his early Tumbleweed Connection record, mm -hmm. which was one of my favorite Elton John records, and a song called uh, Country Comfort. And uh, so did that, and you know, once in a, it's like I always like James Taylor records because he always covered like a Motown tune or something, you know. And some of those were his biggest hits. Yeah, you know? well, no, doubt. no doubt. Never know. Great stuff. Um, who would you say you most um, you resemble the most when it comes to being an artist? Is there anybody? Or I know you're very unique in your own way, but maybe well, like James I, Taylor or somebody like that. You know, I, I I'm big fan of of uh, as singers go. I'm a big fan of Don Henley because what a voice, you know. Yeah. And and Jackson Brown and J D Souther, um, mm -hmm. and and it's interesting because the the first time we worked in the studio together in Nashville, John and Oates and I, we finished a day and I sang all day long and I was worn out and it was time to sing some more after the band left, and he sat down and he slapped me on the knee. He said, "How do you think it went?" And I said, "Well, we got through a whole day without anybody saying you sound like Don Henley." And I he said, "You don't sound like Don Henley." He said, "You sound familiar." There you go. That's what people, and yeah. so people go, well, he sounds, because people want to do that. They want to say, right. well, who right. does he sound like? Kind of like you're asking. Mm -hmm. And so John's answer was one of the best I've heard, which is you sound familiar. Mm -hmm. It sounds comfortable. And people aren't sure what it is, but it's like something they already like, which is right. nice, you know? Yeah. So those those guys are the ones I grew up listening to. But I also grew up listening to a lot of Almond Brothers and blues stuff you know boss gags is one of my favorites oh so, no shuffle that yeah one, oh gosh yeah Such i must have played low down a thousand low down, times low down i wore that out on the turn too back. yeah <laughs> we, we, we'd play these bars these bars from 10 till 2 at night and we had to play it like three times a night you know i was playing drums and singing it that's so awesome though and and boss is still doing his thing so that's yeah cool. yeah he's he is so he is so chilled out when he's playing and he's just that's him you know it's cool exactly Exactly. And I'm glad you said that, that, um, it's not, you know, you don't sound like Don Henley. You, you sound familiar. I love that. that because no artist wants to be, well, he sounds like Don Henley. It, right. You want to get that. Sound it's, familiar feeling. it's very comfortable. As soon as we yeah. hopped on tonight, what did I say? I'm like, I love his voice. I was, didn't even <laughs> know. I, I mean, I've just been getting familiar with your music and just sitting back and just listening to your voice. It's just, very comfortable, very soothing. Like any song I played, I loved. Yeah. I didn't even well, thank you. It was, thank you. It was fantastic. So I'm uh, no. definitely going to stay with you to make sure that that uh, cover album comes out because I will be looking for that one. Well, yeah, and, I, and I'm and I'm writing all the time, and I have some other stuff I'm working on. But I think in the interim, just to give myself a break from thinking too hard, I'm going to go in there and just knock some stuff out that feels familiar. You know, there you so, go. And comfortable. Yeah. And comfortable. When you uh, head out to record, um, obviously it's COVID now, but under, before this, when you would go out to Nashville to record, do you try to play uh, and perform out at some of the places, like you mentioned, the station in? Or if I can, if I can, yeah. And I, and I, uh, I haven't done it in a while, but I'd go to some songwriter nights, you know, and try to just jump in there. And, you know, I know a lot of guys say, well, I don't do that, you know, because it's, you know, I'm above that somehow. I just don't see that. I think, I think you jump in there and you meet, I've met some of the right. coolest people because I, I'm lucky. I mean, I have this place to fall back on and I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not starving, but there are some people that go down in there and really, really mm -hmm. tough it out, you know, trying to get a break. And a lot of them just don't, you know, but they, they, they come away better writers and better singers generally if they work at it. So um, it's, I do that. You know, one of the things I've been thinking about, I just, this just occurred to me and about this pandemic is what's the future of gigging going to look like. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, I've gotten where I've just gotten where I didn't play bars and places with TVs on the walls anymore, <laughs> you know, over the last few years and, and playing listening rooms and house concerts and um, places like our art center where we can have 175 people mm -hmm. and it's dead quiet and you can tell the story you know, the, having this book accompany the record, I have a whole story to, to support it, you know? So my wife and I've been talking and she really thinks the house concert thing is probably as much a part of the future as anything, because it's people, you know, it's not a big group of people, True. you know? So we'll see. I don't know. Oh, that might be a good, a good option. A good idea. I noticed, um, 
the other night that Brad Paisley did a drive-in concert. Yeah. Um, and I thought that was kind of unique. Um, you know, people just drive and you got to stay with your car and all that, and you still have to social distance. But it, he was actually on that stage, and uh, I believe so. It was a live, a live show, a live show. Yeah, yeah. Parking lot of Nissan Stadium, I believe. Wow, you are correct. Really, really cool. I, I kind of like that idea. Um, but then again, I don't know if the artist can actually travel outside the state or come to New York, as we we talked about a little while ago. Uh, we have a list of states that if you travel to or from, you have to quarantine for 14 days before you can do anything now. The governor's got, there must be, I don't know, 25, 28 different states now. Right. And if you think about what it takes to move a show like that, I mean, yeah. even, a, even a stripped down version, you've got a couple of semis and several buses and a crew of 40 people or whatever. And it, it's, uh, it's, tough. it's really put a crimp in our style, you know? All it takes is one one person to leave the pack, and go do something, yep. and then you never know, and then, God forbid, but yeah, you know, and it just spreads from there. So yeah, I know, interesting stuff, David. Absolutely, we're chatting with David Starr, singer songwriter. Uh, David's in Colorado right now, but spends some time in Nashville as well. He's got uh, nine albums out there. He he writes all his own stuff. He sings all his own stuff. And I tell you, if you if you haven't if you haven't heard it, you've, and I mentioned this earlier, uh, go online, go to David Starr, just Google it, David Starr Musician, and you'll you'll see what this guy's all about, man. That's pretty cool. I just, your history, and it's so cool because, I mean, we talked to all different artists and songwriters, and it's, it's, I think it's pretty neat to talk to somebody like yourself who, you know, I, like you said, we're not, we're not youngsters anymore. And, you, and I mean this in a good way. You've got yeah. the experience. You've learned from experience. You know what works, what doesn't work. You've got the connections. You've got some very, very good friends. Y'all kind of help each other out. I mean, what? Yep. And, and that comes with experience. That comes with time. That comes mm -hmm. with years. And it just, and, and like you say, you know, you're not starving. You're, you're doing all right. And you're doing what you love. So, yeah. 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 I, I feel, I feel really blessed and fortunate. And like I said, I, the view at my house is beautiful. I've got this, you know, this building where my store is and, and I'm, you know, I, I, I try to do things for my community to make it a better place. So when I'm gone, there'll be something left of me, you know, here. And I think that's what you got to do. And, uh, um, I just had a funny thought about, about how you wind up sounding. Um, you guys know who Roy Bookbinder is. He's a, I've heard of him. Yeah. A blues guitar player and yeah. a summer and a finger style guy. And, mm -hmm real kind of a blues character. And uh, he used to come to my store back, back down in Arkansas and he'd do these, uh, he'd do these uh, clinics. And I was really not a very good guitar player. And I really was trying to learn finger style and just grow, you know, as a guitar player. And uh, I remember saying to him one day, I said, Roy, you know, every time I see you do one of these, I learned something. He said, little here, little there, pretty much pretty soon you sound like yourself. <laughs> uh, it's so so, true, though. that sort of goes along with yeah, what john yeah. said you know, i don't know why i thought of that but no 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 exactly i'm glad you did i'm glad you mentioned that it, that's pretty cool that is definitely something to pass on to the kids yeah you know, exactly. find their way after a while well, they'll I, find i have i have people come in the store there's a big picture of stevie ray vaughn in the store that i bought years ago from a photographer uh -huh. staking at the new orleans jazz fest years ago before he died and and I'll have people come in and they'll go, how do I sound just like him? And I go, you don't. Right. Nobody, you know, there are a lot of guys that get close and there's some really good players, but everybody comes to the table with their gift, you know, and mm -hmm. you can buy all the amps you want and I'll sell them to you, but it's not going to get you there. It's, you got to be that, you got to be who you are, you know? It goes back to what I was saying. You want, you don't want to sound just like somebody. No. You can sound familiar, if you mentioned but you don't want to sound just like it. Then there's no uniqueness to you. There's no, none of that. So there's no you there, you know? Yeah, there's no you. Exactly. exactly. Hey, um, we have a question. Do you, John Regalia. I'm not sure if you know him. Oh, yeah. Skip. Yes, I do. He, He's a musician. Mm -hmm. He wanted to know if uh, David has written any songs um, pulling inspiration from a painting. I see that question. You know what? Um, I'm a huge Vincent Van Gogh, um, I guess fan, but I, I don't, maybe that's the wrong word. Sounds kind of funny, but he is, he has inspired me just, just the intensity of his work. And I grew up thinking 
for instance, I had a, I had a self portrait. It was a poster and it was big, right? It was poster sized. Mm -hmm. And for some reason in my head growing up, I thought that's how big that painting was. Mm -hmm. It's about this big. <laughs> and I remember the first time I saw it, I just had to sit down and stare at it. Um, so getting to back to, to John's question, I've actually got a song that I started about 12 or 13 years ago that references him and his work and his life. So, um, John, thanks for reminding me. I got to finish that song and do something with it. <laughs> so John? I was just, yeah, a song that sits for you start something 12 years ago. It's probably sitting in a pile of songs that you started. So, uh, you know, do you ever sit back and say, let me go through that pile and see what I might pull out of there. And you, you know, uh, along those lines, the way I write, I go to my, uh, I got my, my notes thing on my phone. Right. Yep. And we're always, we're all doing grocery lists and when to pick the dog up at the vet and stuff. Well, songwriters are forever. They'll have a line and they'll speak it in there so they don't forget it. Mm -hmm. I must have 10,000 of those. And every now and then I'll go, what? There was something about a painting. What? And I'll just search the word painting without search engines. We'd all be doomed, oh, you know, we'd be messed up. <laughs> no doubt. So, so yeah, I'll go back like, I've got a lot of things started and I know when I go back to do an album of my own stuff again, I will go through there and I'll print things out and I'll go, okay, this kind of goes with this and it kind of cut and paste until I have a coherent idea and then I can kind of rough it out from there. But uh, the painting thing's a good idea. I'm going to, I'm going to revisit that. Thank you. I know one thing I need to do is take the computer away from my son because Zachary has written how many, <laughs> if you can see all these messages, uh, he's upstairs on a computer. So it's like, all right. And uh, yeah, it does, does look like somebody's. Uh... <laughs> uh, Zach is, uh, he's my son. He's down syndrome and uh, he, uh -huh. he's our gift. He's awesome, but he's upstairs on a computer. So you see all those where it says Zachary. That's, uh, hey. that's yeah. my guy. That, you know, he's asking that, like, uh, you know, when he puts Old Town Road in there, it's like. You know? Well, I was thinking, I, I, my grandkids love that song, but I don't know it. I don't. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I know it, but. Yeah, yeah. but I get you. Uh -huh. I wanted to mention that. And John Regalia is a, um, he actually he was on the podcast here a while ago and I'd love to get him back again. He's a musician. He spends a lot of time in Nashville. He's, uh, uh -huh. he's, he's put his stuff, uh, he's recorded quite a bit and, uh, just, just a great guy all the way around another one. And I know he loves to write. So it's kind of, that was a cool question. I like yeah. it. Maybe he and I need to write a song about a painting or something. Uh, maybe, maybe. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> it could yeah. happen. All right. So go ahead. Deb. Next, next on your agenda is to work on your cover songs. And hopefully when you uh, have this thought of doing something like this, what is a time frame that you have in mind? Do you have a goal of six months or eh, whenever it gets done? Well, no, I kind of, I think, you know, now that I've done this a few times, I, I, I think what I'll, the first thing I've got to do is narrow down the list of stuff. Every time I turn around, like I heard a U2 song the other day I hadn't heard in ages. And I thought, oh, man, that would be cool. Uh -huh. And then I, I heard something else. Um, my daughter suggested a song and, and, and that she liked. And I thought, well, OK, I should do that. So I got to I got to whittle it down, either that or make it a double album. But, um, <laughs> of course, you got to pay all these people to use the songs. You got to get licensing. So. Right. Right. The price goes up. But I think I think what I'll do um, is try to, to say, let's have this finished by the end of the year. And then maybe a 21 release or something, but nice. then I don't, I don't even know about doing CDs anymore. I don't know what to do about that oh, whole I thing. I, I don't want to die with 5,000 CDs in my garage, you know? Right. So, right. Now I bet the CD thing, you mentioned it earlier. A lot of that, I hate to say it. I, I loved my CDs. I loved my albums, mm -hmm. you know? And of course the vinyl is coming back. I've, we did vinyl on this current record. So I have one. I'll send you one. Oh, excellent. Uh, the vinyl is very, very cool. That's all coming back. CDs, eh, before they come back again, if they ever do, I, it'll be a long time. Because someone like myself, I said, I love getting the CD packages. and But I get a little more old school, whereas the kids, they'll mm -hmm. grab Spotify, I, uh, iTunes, uh, Apple Music, whatever the heck it yeah. is these days. So that's a tough, tough call. Or you could do just so many CDs and you know, yeah. You know, one I, of the things that a lot of people do is just, just to release a song a month mm -hmm. digitally, but I, I don't know. There's something I'm so used one. to going to, 
to play a gig and having this thing in my hand and going, you can buy this right now. And I, mm -hmm. we were selling quite a few of them until everything shut down. So I think right. part of what was attractive about that with this package is you had a book and a CD. And if you read the book, it gave context to the songs. And so we were kind of on a roll there just for a minute till, but it happened. You know, yeah. I, I, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to read that book. And I'm going to listen to the whole CD, and I'm gonna. So you got a copy of the book? Yeah. No, I will. I will though. I I'm gonna get, get you one. one. I'll make. I'll okay. make sure you get one. Oh, Thank that, you. That, that's just really cool. And I'm kind of wondering, what if you um, like they're coming out with all these download cards? I talk to um, marketers every day. I talk to you know a um, record labels every day with my other job with the radio. Uh, right. But they all want to send me the download cards now as opposed to CDs. I may get some CDs, but I get a lot of download cards. I don't know if you'd be able to do something like that and then put the Could. book at, you know, sell the download card with the book and uh, say jump online and download the whole album. But whatever. You know, the, I, don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Which would you rather get, CDs or download cards? Well, you know what? You're looking at a guy that's just like you. I love the CD. Yeah. And, and, and Deb. And I love having that, you know, the artwork on it. And uh, I may buy a couple of them because I don't want to open one. I want to, yeah. keep, you know, keep right. it in its original form. So, well, you, you're going to get a package of stuff. So, uh, <laughs> I'll ask I, my I millennial children what what they think. How, what yeah. would they want? See what that's, they yeah. say. That's it. You're, you're looking at the shipping and receiving department. So, <laughs> hey, uh, I gotta love it. <laughs> the Man wires many. behind them. Uh, it's behind them, behind the wires, is all the boxes. Yes. Yes. Exactly. No, I mean we have to. I mean, we we ask. Um, the younger adults, you know, what are they like in the future? What's going on? Where are we going? They're going to be able to, you know, do they want the CDs or do they want just a thumb drive with some music on it? Or do they, well, they can download their own music onto a uh, thumb drive or, right. you know, a download card, you know, that's so I don't know. I much, I, I prefer a CD. I think it's pretty cool. And I'm a collector of a lot of that stuff. So, yeah, I've got my, my friend, Mark Wright down in Nashville, who's, not really in the business anymore, but he produced a lot of records, um, very successful for a lot of years. He said, you know, we had records and we all got paid for that. And then cassettes came along and everything got reissued and we all got paid again, <laughs> then CDs and we all got paid again, then streaming, you know, just, nobody's getting paid. Yeah. Nobody's so getting paid. he was, nobody's he considers that sort of the golden years for him, you know, cause yeah. he was right in the middle of it. Timing is everything, you know, David, let me ask you, when you go to Nashville, uh, whereabouts do you record? Um, I've recorded at a couple of places. When I first went down there and, and, and I do for demos and stuff, I go to Beard Music Group, Larry Beard's mm -hmm. place over in Berry Hill. Great group of people, great family, and always has great players. And I met some of my favorite people there on the very first, uh, the very first session. And, uh, but, but lately, uh, and mainly because John got me started over there, and I love the place, is a place called Addiction Sound Studios. And it's owned. It's uh, it's over in Berry Hill on Iris, there near uh, House of Blues Studios and uh, and whatnot. But it's owned by Jonathan Kane, who's the keyboard player with Journey. Oh wow, very oh. cool. So yeah. he owns it, and then it's operated and was sort of built by uh, in partnership with David Kalmuski, who's the head engineer and runs the place. And they've got all this great old analog gear, and it's just a beautiful uh, space. But huge live room so you can get a full band in there and everybody's got lots of room um just everything's first class and the record's mixed you know all analog so it has that sound you know so can't beat that i'm pretty spoiled i'm afraid it's all right nothing wrong with that nothing wrong with that. Got, got some great friends great contacts yeah. and, uh, you can't you can't get any better than that yeah you know a funny funny story last time we recorded there Dan Dugmore has been on several of my records and Dan was Linda Ronstadt's uh, steel player and played with James Taylor and has just played with everybody and still does and met Dan at, at beard studios seven years ago. He just happened to be in the band that day when I went in to make these demos. Anyway, Dan brought an old beat up echo plex, which is a, an early tape echo machine that we yeah. all used to use before they made digital stuff. And it literally looked like it fell off of a truck. It was just all <laughs> scarred up. And, and I said, I mean, this is the kind of stuff that's just so worth it. I said, mm -hmm. 
why'd you bring that old thing to the session? He said, that's the one I used on Blue Bayou. And I went, yes. Oh. You know, so you, you, you just want that mojo on your record, you know? Yeah, that's, so. so cool. that's so cool, the old equipment like that. And it just bringing back that sound, the sound that we really don't hear much of anymore. Sure. Uh, and he knew it and he's old enough to know what to do with it. You know, exactly. You got somebody that knows, knows about it and uh, yep. read it right. And uh, they can recreate that sound. So, sure. you know, David, it's pretty cool chatting with you tonight. I don't know. We've never met until tonight, but um, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I feel like I made some friends and I sure appreciate yep. you having me I feel the same way. It's, um, you know, and here, here again, it goes back to what we were talking about, uh, a whole new way of doing things and uh, we're making new friends right along, you know, right along with it. So, yep pretty cool and um so let's see your youtube channel is what again uh every all of my social media stuff is david star music so that's facebook and instagram and youtube okay and uh your music is available online if somebody wanted to listen to it they can go to youtube probably your channel right? go to youtube you can go to apple music spotify all that stuff and and if you want to buy this new uh project it's all at davidstarmusic.com and their package deals with the LP and the book and the CD and okay. the ball caps and all that whole thing, you know. So, are you selling it. your guitars online too? I don't think I got that far. I, I do sell the guitars at, at starsguitars.com. I, so I'm fun. one of the things I'm most disappointed in is that I haven't put in more time on my store's website during all of this when I could have. Mm -hmm. It's like my least favorite thing to, to work yeah. on. It is. It's, so, that's not. Well, but, I that you had <laughs> water. Um, maybe, uh, the wife, uh, you know, okay. Deb's going to tell me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe I can farm out some of my millennials to, to help out there. Yeah. It's one of those things where you have to take the picture, then you have to write the description, then you, right. and some of it's easy, but like with a used piece of gear, you've got to, you got to make note of every scratch and dent and, and repair and every modification. So, it's something that most of the time it's only me that can really do it and get it like I want it. So, right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, there you go. Something to do uh, for the next couple of months of quarantine until you That's can right. get out to record. So, yep. No, it's, it's been a pleasure, absolute pleasure talking with you. We Thank really you. appreciate you taking the time. And uh, I definitely will be, like I said, listening to the entire CD, mm -hmm. reading the book, and I we definitely hope to see you perform live uh, at some point. I'm in Nashville quite often. My son lives there. We have business there and so forth. So I'll, mm -hmm. I'll be uh, scouting around, seeing if we could catch a show of yours. Hey, I'll come to Syracuse. I don't care. I've got a motor. Home. I got a motor home, and I'm not afraid to drive it. Hey, okay. there you go. Well, you've got a place. If you ever Thanks. decide to make the trip, you want to do something, maybe when all this stuff lifts, so yeah. we'd love to. Uh, to accommodate you and uh, make it happen for you. I'd like really to. Hoping to have a, uh, a nice weekend event with a lot of the artists that we've met and, and so forth. And every time we try to schedule it, we have to unschedule it. So at some point, well, it's love to have I, you. I'll, I'll, make, I'll make myself available if you want to do it sometime. But I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, we Thank appreciate you. you and being here and hearing your story. And um, just everything about you is really cool. I'm very jealous Thank of your view. Because when I look out my front window, a mailbox. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if, if, if you'll go to David Star Music on Facebook, mm -hmm. um, there's a picture of a rainbow last night that was, I yelled at my wife. I said, get the camera, get out here. Because this is like, you get it for just a few seconds and yeah. then it's gone, you know. But it was an amazing picture. So. That happened here, I want to say, last weekend was um, the That's rainbow. The it was the a double. double Oh, but it was real strong, and it, I have all the years I've never ever ever seen something mm -hmm. as bright, and the double both rainbows were bright. It was just amazing, and then wow. my Facebook and uh, cool. It's it's an amazing amazing picture. So well, it gives you it gives you a different outlook when you see something like that. You know, when things are bad, you know, for the of gold. Yep, you find it. Nature, so. nature just blows my mind when you sit yep. there and actually try to comprehend what's going on Can't just with it. that rainbow and it's it's just we'll never know yeah so. john regalia says thanks for the question take care my friend so thank it, you john uh, yes absolutely david thank you let thank you in touch you let us know when that project comes out we'll get you on again we'll talk about it and uh Hopefully we can uh, help you uh, get that project out in front of uh, maybe some fans and some new fans. And uh, we'll just go from there. You're, you're the best, brother. 
Hey, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you.